everything in life starts with a question. We gain understanding of the world we live in by asking questions. If you look at like young kids and how they discover the world, you will realize that curiosity is like a vital part of the of the human nature, right? Um, it's actually what defines us as as human beings. I have a three-year-old son that like like asks questions over and over again. I think if you're kids, you you know that, right? And I made the mistake to like actually like when he asked me questions about some like like um, like one of my computers, I like took him and we took the computer apart. And now he wants to take apart like everything. And I'm not sure, but maybe he's like the only three-year-old that that and his, and his favorite website is like iFixit, right? <laughs> so, so um, though um, the difference between like a kid and a scientist is that even though they share the same curiosity and they're asking questions, the difference is that a scientist asks, uh, answers questions in a different way than maybe a parent or a, or a kid, right? Um, so a scientist needs to provide evidence uh, and make make his or her results reproducible for others, right? Uh, so others can uh, revisit that and evaluate that, right? So it's like a bit like open source, right? I mean, show show me your source code, right? And I will like like check it, right? If like what you're saying is valid, it's easy to get on the stage and um, like tell people whatever they want to hear, but uh, yeah, everybody like then at some point checks the source code and if the system really works, right? I mean, I could fake everything that, <laughs> that I'm doing here, but I mean, you can like. Go and check it, right? And this is like what sets like a, a, a what sets scientists apart from from like kids or maybe other people, right? Um, so how would you reflect that idea that I just outlined uh, in a website? Um, I will give you a little bit of context uh, why I like started to talk about this. The Humboldt University uh, in Berlin, uh, one of like the big universities in Berlin in, and in. Uh, in Germany, ask us to help them with a new website that should run outside of their like main cluster that they run currently with Plum 4. Um, their idea was to have a website to present themselves in a uh, in the German Excellence Initiative, which is an initiative that was started by the German government 13 years ago, uh, and it involves uh, a um, a longer selection process to find the best universities in the country, right? So they they spend or plan to spend like 2.7 billion euros um, in total um, and give them to like uh, to excellent universities to that aim to promote like cutting edge research in Germany, right? This is what like Wikipedia says. And last month, like eight universities in Germany, after this long long selection process, were were selected, right? And you can imagine that this was like quite a big thing. So we sat at our office and we were like watching the live stream and they, them announcing that. And there were like a few su su surprises actually, right? About the universities. But now this is like settled for the next years. And, and the Humboldt University uh, was one of those eight universities that, that won that um, uh, in that initiative. Um, so now that you have context, let's come back to my original idea, right? Like questions and exploration. Um, so the idea of this website was to show the like scientific process that like researchers do in universities and make that idea reflect on the website. So the first idea was like, or the first step in like a scientific process or like for a three-year-old kid is like to ask questions, right? And then explore like possible solutions in either way. So this is the website that like basically loads like this and it starts from zero. Or more or less, except like a bit of a bit of branding, and then it starts. Sorry for like all the German in there, but I will translate it. So um, there's this typewriter animation, and it says like everything begins with a question, right? This is where where it starts, right? If you're like a scientist or or maybe a kid, um, and then when that animation ended, like this question cloud appears, right? So it's different questions that you can ask about the excellence, in excellence initiative, right? What, what, is, what means does excellence mean, right? Uh, do we have to control algorithms and those kind of things, right, that people, people ask? So you can start um, to explore that site. Um, so you can hover over it, you will see that there are like pictures, there are, there are, there are videos, you can scroll down, and at the end, you see that you actually can start to enter your own question. So there's an input field, 
and you can enter your own question. And it, the input field says, like, please ask your own, your own question, right? So you can uh, you can um, you can in, uh, type in a question and then like send that. It will it will ask you before, like, do you really want to send that, right? And explains you a bit like uh, GDPR issues and everything. Um, and then you can actually like send that email, and it goes to review process, and they will actually um, like check those uh, questions and see if they can like produce that and put them on the on the website. So it's meant to be like a bit of interactive um, element in the website. We have to see how it goes, right? Like how many people actually ask questions and if they can keep up with the pace and like uh, answer those questions. Um, so. So we, we are like we, we have all the questions there, right? Some of them they came like the university came up with them. Uh, we are waiting. For, we we got a few uh, like uh, questions from from users, and that will continue, right? But that's only like the first part, right? Everything starts with a question. It does not end with it. So we also have to like answer the question. I won't go like into detail about like scientific processes and stuff, right? So it, it's it, it's a lot more complex than just questions and answers, but. If you have to put something into a design, then you have to simplify things, right? So you have questions and answers, right? You have a hypothesis, of course, and and then like you go to the review process. But in the end, it's like that's what differentiates a scientist from like a three-year-old kid, right? That you have a, a a specific process and that you have like requirements. So let's look at um, what happens if you actually like click on one of those questions. So you click on one of those questions and you get like the answers. So the question is actually uh, there, and on the left side it says like it's it's th this is like the answer, right? Then you have like different forms how you can present those answers. Like you have the text form, you have uh, the image form, and a few other uh, forms like audio and video. But I will come to that in a minute. And then on the right side you see the sidebar, right? So the sidebar you can explore that further. You can like uh, check that that images. You can like zoom them in, and then. Like if if you ever read like a scientific paper, like you have to cite everything, right? Um, I guess not only in Germany there was like big discussions about like PhD thesis and and things like um, where people did not really cite properly, right? So that's like no matter what your studies uh, what 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 your studies are at a university, you need to like cite properly, right? That's that's important. So the idea was that you have this this sidebar and you start to cite actually things, right? So you add references which were links actually, and then ah, that's too too fast for me. Um, so you add links, you add references, you cite something, you quote somebody, and then you can link, right? So all the links are actually. Um, in that design, not in the in the page itself, but on the right side to like reflect that scientific process, right? And the part where I was too slow at at the end is like you have the ability to to um, to tag content, and then it will show this question cloud at the end, and you can actually in the question cloud also enter your question again, right? So it's that same element. Since it's React, it was like super simple, right? We put it on the front page, we put it there, same thing. Um, so super easy. So since like this is about like content management systems and and about Volto, right? Let, let me show you like the editing process for this core content type, right? It was a um, a standard content type that we created. Uh, answer and questions is a one to one um, relation, so we just created one content type, right? Um, so let me show you how the editing uh, looks like. So we are looked uh, we are we are logged in in Volto three, as you can see. Um, and you have the uh, left uh, toolbar, and you can click on Edit, and then you see the Edit view, right? It's it's pretty much the same than the than the view. Um, you saw that like like small uh, hiccup in the middle that's already gone in the new version. You have uh, Draft.js in there, so you can uh, you can do like bold italic. You can add uh, links. You can add HTTP, Google.com, whatever, or you can just type in like two. Uh, um, Two characters, and then sorry, and then choose from that, right? So both internal, internal, and external um, links. Um, then you can go further, and of course you have the standard uh, standard functionality. We strip that down to like to the things that the, the client asked for. Um, so you can choose an image. Then you can choose it from the image chooser. You can like choose image left, image right, if you want. Um, 
and we have the, uh, the, the second element, which is the sidebar. And that's a bit more complex, because you have the editing part, and, um, and the, the, the other element uh, um, actually shows up in the sidebar, right? So we created a block that, in the edit mode, shows up like a, a regular image, but it will move to the right when you, when you actually save. You will see that um, when we scroll down a bit. That was kind of a compromise. Because in every project you have a budget, right? And we would be able to to do that actually in the sidebar, but it's like quite complex, right? So this element now shows up there, and the client basically told us like we don't care that much, right? They're like used to like all kind of like systems that are really like crappy when it comes to user interface, so they like they they like that a lot already uh, by default. So uh, we hadn't like to super polish that, uh, though. Since this is like a standard content type, you also have like the, the, the metadata field, right, which moved to the right in Volto 4. Um, so you have like the default metadata. Um, you can upload uh, videos and audios, which I come to later. Um, you have the standard settings. You have the categorization that that is used for the uh, for this for this uh, question cloud, right? Um, you have publishing date, and uh, we have Kit Concept Zio there as an add-on product, so you can overwrite the uh, uh, very basic uh, Zio um, Zio fields, right? So that's that's the basic editing of the uh, of the main content type. Um, so you already saw like in the in the editing that we we offer like rich media and before as well, right? So you can you can um, you can switch between different. Um, Different uh, forms of like showing uh, showing um, uh, content, right? So one of the things that the client wants to have is an image gallery, right? That's pretty much standard when you look at like uh, news websites or newspaper websites that you have a um, uh, an article, and in this article you have a few images, right? And then you want to like switch to the image gallery and show all the images that you have. Um, all together, right? This is something that I, I'm not sure if that like international news sites do that as well, but in Germany, all the sites like basically do that. So they wanted to have something like that, right? Um, and those are like the different different kinds of presentation modes, right? So you have answers that are text. You have answers where you can switch to the uh, to the image gallery, or you can switch to audio and video, and that this is like the the image gallery, right? You can switch back to like audio, video, or image gallery. Um, you can share um, your information, and and at the bottom there's lots of like legal information, right? Like who should shot the photo, uh, and all those kind of things. Uh, then you see here that we have like a Netflix-like animation, right? So if you don't move, then it will like fade out, right? And if you like move again, uh, then it uh, fades in again, right? And then you like just uh, can go uh, right and left, and then back to the to the text view, right? So that's this is something that's like completely configurable by, by the by the editors, right? They can upload um, upload videos, audios, whatever. Um, so videos, the next thing here, you see a video example. Um, since universities like mainly target like uh, or at least partly target like younger folks, and I can tell from first hand experience that like all our interns, when I ask them like how do you want to learn, right? Uh, like do you want that big book or do you want to watch an ACAD course? They're all like yeah, ACAD course, sure. I mean, I just sit there and watch it, right? Good. So uh, yeah, YouTube is incredibly important. Uh, of course, they have a YouTube channel, and all we do is like use the YouTube blog. Um, or uh, in that case, uh, actually, just an, a field where you enter the the YouTube video, right? And it will show it up. So that was like, that's like super easy. But you can still like switch between the two. Um, so next thing that we have is is audio. Um, so the idea, one of the ideas that we we came up uh, with together with the agency and the um, and the client was um, uh, of an audio um, of combining like audio. Uh, with a slideshow, right? Because like listening to audio is like if it's like done very well and everything, it might be like interesting, but it could be also a bit boring, right? Like especially if you're like visually oriented, like just uh, listening to audio might not be enough. So they came up with the idea to have this like audio uh, track and then allow the editors to uh, tell when to show like the next slideshow element. And you can see that here. This is a splash screen animation that you see, and then if you Oops, oh crap, that was this. So, splash screen animation, and then you hit play. And then you see on the left side, 
I'm not sure if you if you can see it in a good way um, that you uh, you have you see the audio track right and it will switch soon to another to another uh, image and then you see like a small uh, a small line there right uh, so yeah and then it switches to the to the next one right and this is something that's completely configurable by the editors right so they can go to clone and can say okay after 50 seconds this image uh, shows up and then this image right and that was that was kind of the idea. Um, another that that was that, that was like all the all the multimedia elements that we have right text audio video and uh, image galleries. Uh, then they also want to wanted to have a block right so their idea would, would be uh, was that like scientists wherever they they are right in Alaska or whatever right they can write blog posts about that right that would be like pretty cool and they wanted to have a block with a, like a simple publication workflow. So we created a, a block section there, right? So this is like the the block. Uh, it's it's called like uh, HU unterwegs, like HU on, on on the road. So Humboldt University on the road. Uh, you have an overview um, page. This is the navigation. Um, yeah, you can you can go to the to the block section. You can click there, uh, and it's like it's super easy. It's nothing special, right? You have an image, uh, a lead image actually. Uh, then you have the legal uh, information, and you have like uh, the standard text stuff, right? So nothing special. In in the blocks, it's actually you don't even have a sidebar, right? That was something that like the designers decided that that shouldn't have a sidebar because only the 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 answer or the question should have this scientific dish thingy on the right side, right, to differentiate that. So that's like standard Volto, right, it's almost boring. I already showed you that quite a, quite a, quite a few times already uh, during the conference, so image left, right. Um, nothing really special here, so I could as well just like skip that. Um, another thing that I wanted to do is like to have profiles for like the top scientists, right, to like show them what they're doing and like, I mean, you know how that, that works at universities, right? You get one of the top-notch like uh, scientists, and then you want to like like show them, right? And show like profiles uh, of them. So this is also something um, that we did. So you go to the navigation. Um, the first like three parts, like questions, answer, answers, uh, and people, are actually fixed, and the rest of the navigation is like blown. Uh, and flexible. So you have this mentionary uh, view here that we did. We just grabbed uh, a random React application, and you can go to the um, to the individual page, right? Um, this is of course uh, uh, dummy content, right? Chomsky isn't at the uh, Humboldt University, um, but uh, yeah, there you see the the edit view, and that's an example of like a standard. Content type, right? You can still do like standard content types in uh, in Volto, right? You just create them like you're used to, and they will show up like that, right? So, with zero React knowledge, you can do a content type like that. You just create a schema, XML, Python through the web, whatever you want, and it will show up like that, right? And you can use it, and that's good enough. Um, if you have like uh, content that's like highly structured. Like like with those profiles, right? You have so you have a name, um, you have uh, uh, the number of publications uh, and the biography, and that's it, right? So you don't need that flexibility. We could have well as well have done that with with the fancy Volto editor, but there was no reason to do that, right? Um, so we didn't, um, and that's almost like too boring to show because that's like standard content editing, right? So they also wanted to have like standard content management capabilities. Um, and this is how it looks like. Um, so as I said, like the first three were like are kind of fixed because those are like the questions and the answers that you can you can go to overview pages. I will skip that here. And the rest is something that the the editors can freely like uh, like fill, right? So we have this overview page for the excellence cluster. It has listings. Um, as said, I mean nothing special, right? You can add images there if you want, left, right, like the same as block, right? So we basically have three content types that are pretty much alike, like the question answer content type, uh, content uh, content type, and block content type, right? I know that uh, on the stage yesterday I said that like I want that single content type, right? But there's a good use case for like having multiple content types if that makes sense to your users, right? So Plone strengths was always like uh, to be like super flexible, right? And I don't want to take that away from Plone. So it's totally fine to 
create a bazillion of content types if you, if you have that use case, right? And if that makes sense. Like, Robert, uh, like, like Rodrigo said in his, in his talk, like we actually like migrated a client from using a single content type to multiple content types because that just makes sense to us, right? So I don't like, it's not that I dislike content types, right? So that you didn't get like the wrong, wrong impression. So um, that were the basics, but I would like to share like a few pretty common requirements uh, when we do Volto pages, right? Um, so if we uh, at Kit Concept like do Volto pages, we have like recurring um, requirements, which is something where Plone really shines, right? Because it comes with a lot out of the box. Um, and usually you can you can just go to to client meeting and they ask you yeah can you do like multilingual and whatever and you just say yeah check 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 right and then like you have the deal right more or less uh, it's not that simple with with Volto yet we're getting there um, but I wanted to like share a few of the like, standard requirements that we have so the first requirement is multilingual right um, like actually all the sites except like the first two Volto sites that we did had that requirement multilingual right and um, I. I, I used to work at the UPC in Barcelona for two years, and I worked with Ramon and Victor. This is where I met them, um, and uh, I know how complex like multilingual is, right? It's an, it's an incredibly complex um, topic, and it's something that not much, many systems in the world get right, right? And it's still like, it's hard. So what's the status of multilingual in Volto? Uh, so the basics in place. The basics means we have uh, uh, the language negotiation, that mechanism, right? That when you like go to the, to the site at first, that it like does those like three to four checks um, uh, and tries to figure out what kind of language you would, you would like to have and then it shows it, right? And then if you switch, it stores the uh, cookie with your language preferences, right? Um, which lately, like lots of clients tried to tried us to like remove because of GDPR issues. They came to us and said, like, can you remove the like the sticky bit and uh, the, the session cookie and the and the multilingual cookie maybe, right? And we were like, mm, we could, but you don't want to do that, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, but back to multilingual. Um, so the language switcher was also trivial to implement, right? It's just React, like setting a cookie, so like. Every intern, like with two weeks of experience, can do that, like with React, right? So that's that's super simple. Um, so that was like more or less enough for us to like get our clients started and get our clients happy. We were we were quite open with that, right? If a client asks us for 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 a requirement, um, I won't lie to them when when it comes to Volto, right? I say like, okay, this is like something new that we're building, and this is the stage, right? And like, we, if we have enough budget, then we can do that. But it could also be something that's like. That's like hard to implement, right? And uh, just tell them, okay, we have the option to like go back with old Plone, and so far none of the clients wanted to go that way. Um, so we implemented multilingual. The good thing is that uh, Victor told me that it's like uh, that's that everything like on the REST API level and stuff is in place, so we don't have to migrate anything. It's just something that's missing on on Volto now, right? And what's missing is like actually the direct link between like the like uh, the content object that are like deeply nested, right? If you go like to the down to the content tree uh, to a, to a page, and then you want to switch to the language. Currently, it's switched back to the to the root, right? Which is something that quite a lot of systems actually do that don't do multilingual right. Um, and it's something that we will definitely like uh, want to implement in the next like I'd say like three or four months uh, because like we have that requirement a lot, and if we have budget in a project over, we will like most likely implement it. And the other thing is then like a bit harder. Maybe because it includes like UX uh, is uh, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, side by side view of like multiple languages, right? So you have an English uh, version, you want to translate it to maybe Italian, and then you have them like side by side, so you can translate it, right? Because we have blocks now, and um, yeah, that might be a bit harder. But anyways, I'm pretty sure that we will like that we'll get there, right? So multilingual is kind of like a check with some like additional loads, um, but we'll get there. Another really like basic requirements for actually actually all of our sites right from the start is accessibility. Uh, in Germany, if you have a, like uh, a public website, a government client or anything, you have to sign a contract that says like uh, WCGA um, and stuff, so you have to make sure that's accessible. No way around that, right? Um, 
And at Key Concept, we have lots of clients like that are public uh, institutions, universities, and and government bodies, right? That's like one of like a big part of our, our client base. Um, so it's clear that we need we we need to be we need Volto to be accessible, and the state of accessibility is not that bad. I mean, usually people think that like JavaScript is like there are still people that think that if you do do a JavaScript site, like there's no way that it can be accessible, right? That's like that's just far from the truth. That's not the case, right? Actually. The tools that are around for accessibility are quite sophisticated, actually. So you have static code analysis, you have uh, you have Cypress tests that you can test. So you can automate a, a lot, lots of things, right? That's not everything, but it's a pretty good base, actually. And at the Beethoven Sprint, we put the basics in place. So we have like uh, static code analysis, we have those uh, uh, acceptance tests that do the accessibility checks, and we run them both on Volto Core where they pass and on our client projects right from the start, right? And then it's not that much of an issue because that's a good thing about CI and like automated testing, right? So if you introduce something, like the CI will, auto will, will show you right away, okay, you did something wrong, right? You forget something, so please fix it. So it's not that much of an issue. Um, and um, yeah, we will, also we had clients that like that like started to do audits and for the uh, Humboldt University actually we'll get an external audit. So the Humboldt University hired uh, an external uh, agency to do a, an accessibility audit for our, our site and we will like hear from them hopefully uh, soon about that and see what they think about like the accessibility, right? And for another project we also have that. Um, there's also the possibility of a European Union funded project um, where we can get another audit uh, 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 for accessibility, right? So I think we have a pretty good base already um, and it will, it will even further improve. And Paul uh, is, is doing a fantastic job there as well and helping there. So um, yeah, the this state is, is, is quite, quite, quite good. Then we come to like kind of a delicate topic, which is loading time, right? Um, this was actually one of the reasons why I moved away from Plone and to the JavaScript world in the first place, right? Because Plone was just too slow. That, that was the thing. I mean, I like Plone, I like Python and everything. I didn't like JavaScript. Uh, and the only reason why I like at some point like tried out Angular and React and stuff was because like Plone was too slow. The approach was too slow for like our use case. So it went on from there. Um, so in every project, what, what's best practice is like that they have a kind of performance budget, right? Which is basically the bundle size because that's the main limiting factor, right? In modern JavaScript, you like, or even in Plone 5, let's, let's face it, you, you have a huge bundle um, of, of JavaScript. If you don't do that, then you're screwed anyways. Um, so we have a huge bundle and if you don't do server-side rendering, then you have to transfer everything to the client. Um, load the huge bundle, uh, you choose, uh, load your CSS, then execute that in your browser and then you can show the website, right? So this is something where Volto is a lot, lot better than, than standard Plone, but still loading times are an issue and you don't get like fast loading times for free, right? The more you add, you have to pay for that, right? For every single thing that you add to the bundle, you have to like pay for that in terms of the performance uh, budget because your bundle grows bigger, you can do code splitting and stuff. And But in the end, my experience is that if you don't have a performance budget and you're not careful with what you add, you will screw it up, right? You can screw up any any site. Actually, when I, um, when I did my first um, uh, Gatsby site, and Gatsby is out of the box blazing fast, right? You get like 99 points by on, on PSI from Google and stuff. And what I did was I added a custom font there because we use that in our corporate design, right? And then immediately like everything dropped, right? And it was like I got 60 or something. So I broke my Gatsby site, my first one, with like my first commit basically, right? So you can screw up the best systems on earth if you do things wrong, right? No system on earth will prevent you from that. Um, so we work together with an agency, right, for that for that design, um, and the agency like came to us and said, okay, we want that image gallery, we want that audio player. Um, the Humboldt University came to us and said, we want an HTML block so we can like uh, just like enter HTML, right? Um, and uh, every single time they came to us, I said like. Yeah, sure, we can do that, but like that will hurt performance, right? And at some point, we have a certain budget, and and if we push that too hard, your site will be slow, right? Um, and the agency like always came back to us and said like, yeah, hey, you know what? That's like super easy, right? I mean, uh, just in the in the in the image gallery, just do what Netflix does, right? Super easy. No, uh, <laughs> the web is not like 
an app, right? So let's have a look what we are competing with here, right? Because that's the perception of like clients and also like of agencies, right? Because they don't they don't have an in-depth understanding of like the technology behind that, and they just expect it to happen, right? This is something that um, Albert also said. We're not competing with like WordPress and Drupal. We are competing with Google and Facebook on the UX level, right? And let's have a look what we're up to, right? This is what we're up to. So Netflix is like 60 megabyte, like the app, right? On your, on your phone, that's like on an iPhone. Um, Facebook is like 170 megabyte, right? And people just think like whatever they have on their phone, right? It's like the same as a website, right? So they have like this huge like budget and amount that they can use, right? To have a rich user experience and do all the fancy things that the app does, right? And for the user, it's, it's the same, right? They just look at it and say, it runs on my phone, right? So why don't do it? So, so this is what we're up to, right? And this is not the only thing. That's only like the front end requirements, right? The image gallery and stuff, that's easy. We also have like the editing UI where we add lots of stuff. I mentioned the HTML uh, block, right? So we added a, uh, a library that does uh, syntax highlighting for the HTML, right, for the blocks. And that's like 20 kilobytes gzip, right? It's all Paul's fault, by the way. He wanted to have that. And we shipped that in our, in our bundle right now, right? <laughs> so we have to either have like proper like code splitting and like lazy load that end thing, or we have to kick it out. But um, yeah, anyways, just like side note, we won't kick it out, no, no worries. Um, so, but this is what we're up against, right? So on the one hand, we have all those requirements, and on the other hand, we, we, like people expect it to be fast. Because the first thing that like, the Humboldt University did when we shipped it to them was like, sending us a PageSpeed Insight, right? With, like, the, with the numbers. And the thing is that um, uh, Anton did that great talk about like, perceived performance and, uh, and actual performance. All the um, screencasts that you saw here, I did them all on 3G, not by choice, but because in my uh, in my hotel room, like the Wi-Fi really really sucks, and I'm I did all of them with 3G. Seriously, right? Please try that with with Plone, with standard Plone. And that was like really quick. I don't know if you, if you noticed that, but it, I mean, it, to me, it feel, felt like quick when I like when I when I checked it, right? The editing experience and the switching between the sides, right? That's something that we, you would never ever be able to to do with Plone with a like slow 3G 3G connection. Okay, so let's revisit. What, what can you do with Svolto to sum up things? Um, I would say like quite a bit. Of course, I'm biased, so, so like, don't, don't believe me, right? Look at the facts, look at the source code and everything. Try it out yourself. But I showed you um, a website that's based on like agency requirements, and they pushed us quite a bit, right? Um, because like what, what the web can do, right? Because they wanted kind of like an exceptional design that like derives pretty much from what lots of other websites do, right? And then you realize, oh, that's not that easy. I never tried that, and it's not that easy. And something that you don't see if you look at the site, right? Um, so it's like subtle differences. Um, but we could make that work, because we have React, right? L right look at the mentionary thing. I, I first looked at the rhyme, and I was like, mm, I don't know. But then like you, you, like, you just like choose a random library from the thousands of libraries that you have, and it just does the trick, right? So that's that's easy, right? So other, part, other things are really, really easy. So I think we could do a lot. Um, so let me show you like one other use, use case that we have from the opposite uh, spectrum, I think, of like websites that we do. Um, Dylan said in Tokyo, um, and I hope I can quote him on that, uh, when we showed, the, showed him Volto, he said, um, I don't know about Volto. I mean, there is a use case for ugly websites, right? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I strongly disagree with with Dylan, right? We don't do at least as Skill Concept, we don't do ugly websites, right? No matter what what client that is. Though I, I I think I kind of like understand what he means, right? Because like Dylan, I think he's also doing lots of like government client websites and stuff, and. We're not allowed to like show you like the actual website of the of, of our government client, but you can take any like high level government client in Germany and their website will look like something like that, right? So disclaimer, this is not our client, right? So this is a different site. But it doesn't matter because they all look the same, right? They're like I think twelve or eighteen highest level public institutions in Germany, and they all look the same, right? They even have the same design manual and stuff, and the, the same typo. And so there's not much flexibility here, right? And this is how the actual website looks like, right? So you have the header, you have the navigation, 
then you have this this slider here uh, that usually s shows the head of the ministry or whatever that is, right? Because that seems to be like really important. Um, and you have this sli slider here. Then you have like a grid-like element with two elements, uh, so that shows that that's actually the news. Um, and then you have like three elements. Then you have a Twitter if they're really like hip and and up to date. They have a Twitter feed. Uh, they have a YouTube video, and then they have like a few other things, right? So that that's like one of the other like projects um, uh, that we had and that we did with Walter, which I think are like like a bit of the opposite end, right? Uh, and that also worked quite well for us uh, with with Walter, right? Um, so I think like ex at, at least at the spectrum uh, that that Plone usually covers, uh, Volto uh, can actually cover those use cases, right? Um, so, so, so to summarize and sum things up, um, I think Volto is a good choice for like large government sites, for university projects. You have to be careful, of course, with every project, right? Like to to check what what Volto can do, and you shouldn't just like throw Volto on like 500 Plone instances, right? And expect like everything to work, of course. Um, so there's always like a good good reason to choose Volto and and a good reason to not choose it, like with every every other system, right? Um, I think it's also a good choice for like large corporate internets, intranets, which is one of the use cases that, that, that we have um, right now. And it works for design-heavy websites that push the boundaries of the web platform as well as like maybe a bit more like boring or traditional websites that just need, need to scale, right? Um, and that was like uh, about it. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm I'm Timo, like Tist on GitHub, uh, Timo Stollenberg on uh, on Twitter. That's my plone.org email. Feel free to like shoot out to me if you have any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Timo. Is there any question? Ah, come on. Okay. Come on again. <laughs> Hi, Timo. Thanks. Then I'll just I'll make up a random question. Yeah. I mean, you have to continue talking, thanks, right? Yeah. Um, you showed us the, 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 the. You still can do content types. That's really wow. Like you don't have to do anything schema. Um, how do you think for the next months? Uh, because that's the thing we've also been talking at the Beethoven Sprint uh, with the. The, the, the properties page with the normal content type, uh, the stream with the blocks, which are really cool for the multimedia and the, the freakish editors that want to control everything. And some of the metadata, for example, with news items and events, which are on the properties page, but you also want them in the stream. Can you tell a bit more about that? Yeah. Because uh, you, want, so to, you yeah. want to put them in the stream yep. and you want to edit them, have to edit them on the properties page. And I'm afraid that our entry-level editors will get confused between switching to the two and where they can find yep. the start and end of a news item or for an event date yep. and these kinds of things. As always, uh, with Walto, that's not a technical problem, but like a UX problem, right? And actually, to tell the truth, we did like all variations that you can imagine, right? So we did the standard plone stuff of like... Uh, the, that was what we did first, right? Uh, description and like the standard lead image. So we have a, a block that has a lead image plus a title, right? And that's fixed at the top, right? So you can do that easily. That's not, not a problem. Um, we also have quite a few clients that ask us to like separate that specifically to have a, like a teaser and maybe sometimes even a different teaser image and a different with a different uh, with a uh, different uh, sub subline and 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 rights and everything, right? So sometimes we have like four uh, four fields and that like duplicated, so we have eight fields just for the preview, right? So there are clients that ask us for that. Um, we have also clients that ask for like to, to auto generate that, right? So it's something that we have to decide as a community what should be the default, um, and that's a process we have to go through. Um, but Plone is so flexible that that you can like cover all the use cases dependent on your client needs, right? And this is what we always did, and this continues to work. So um, did I answer your question? Okay. So thank you, Timo. Again. Thank you.